Hello, this is Mr. Ferreira, and I'm going to be talking you, you through explanations for obedience. Now, in lessons, I explained to you that there are going to be a number of different explanations, and that one of them, for example, was the foot in the door technique, or gradual commitment was another one. You can find these sometimes online, certainly in older textbooks, where we used to do a number of explanations for obedience, you can certainly find them. However, the expectation is that you are a able to explain in detail the agentic state explanation and the legitimate authority explanation. And therefore, if you're going to do extended writing, it is wise to kind of stick to the specification. Now, I also showed a silly kind of Taylor Swift type video to remind people of the Milgram experiment in which I just would recommend you look online for the different things that you can find. I'm going to go straight into the concept. The first explanation is called the agentic state. Uh, in order to first of all um, just define the agentic state we do say it's used in the context of obedience so it's only kind of really works for obedience and it only really works I would say arguably in destructive obedience because it says here about do something that they see is wrong. So this whole idea, a kind of moral strain that you would put on trying to obey something that you don't want to obey. And it says here that in order to obey, the person hands over the responsibility for the outcome to the authority figure. So we have this handing over to the authority figure. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I don't want you to get confused with is that authority figure may well be a legitimate authority figure, but this is a different explanation. This is trying to explain how the person kind of makes a, a kind of a, a shift from, from one state to the other. And it's this whole kind of question of moral strain and try to hand over responsibility to the authority figure. So let's get into a bit more detail. <clears throat> What we see here is that Milgram said that destructive authority or destructive obedience uh, only occurs because a person does not take responsibility. Okay, so we saw this in the Milgram video saying, I don't want to hurt that man, you know, I don't want to be responsible. And the experiment is like, I will be responsible. But so the person hands over responsibility over to the person in authority. And it's like they're acting as an agent. Okay, so there we see two pictures or a picture of two people and holding up their guns. It's kind of like a, a James Bond type, type of figure. James Bond can kill somebody, <clears throat> but when he does, he's not doing it for his own pleasure. He's doing it because he has to, because he's an agent of Her Majesty the Queen. Okay, so this explanation for obedience talks about how when you don't want to obey but you feel you need to um, you you kind of have this moral strain and ultimately you allow yourself to kind of let go and act as an agent of authority and you hand over responsibility um, to the authority figure <clears throat> and this is because most of the time uh, Milgram felt that we do act in an, in an autonomous state we, we kind of know what we do, when we do it, and how we're doing it. Um, however, we are sometimes in a position where we struggle to act autonomously. And so, so example of Milgram's participants in these experiments. And at that particular st uh, state, um, it, there's a bit of conflict. And so he talks about an agentic shift to the agentic state. Excuse me. So this agentic shift is the shift from autonomous to acting as an agent, and it's usually to a person with greater power. And the reason we would do this is because there's this social hierarchy, this situation where some people have the authority and the power over us. And so we see some of his participants saying, I was only obeying orders. 
Now, Milgram says we're socialized into acting agentically from a very young age. The moment you were toddlers <clears throat> and started getting into things, your parents often probably would have said, no, don't do this, don't do that. In public, they were perhaps embarrassed if you made too much noise or you were told to act in a particular way or not to question what's going on. That's kind of what he talks about in terms of socialising. So therefore, going back to the explanation, we say, well, we expect this of children. We learn not to be rude. OK, and this also involves social situations. <clears throat> and if we do disrupt social situations, that causes us stress. So therefore, we learn very quickly not to question authority not to question of perceived authority. So we need to kind of get this in terms of a perspective. It's not something that happens automatically. We don't walk into a room and we go, oh yeah, there's <clears throat> the there's there's the, the authority. Milgram is talking about the reason why you would exp uh, explain destructive obedience is that it causes us kind of the stress and anxiety. We're familiar with it in terms of challenging the, the, the social norms. So therefore, if these participants had to, had to kind of break that, they would feel that they were breaking some kind of social force. And these social forces bind us. So therefore, it's easier to obey and become an agent of the authority. So it's no longer my actions, but the actions that are important to keep kind of society working as they are. So there's my example of refusing to do what the experiment to asked of us. It will bre breach that kind of commitment that we previously made. Now, <clears throat> I would recommend you go to your textbook, you have a look over um, kind of the agentic state, please kind of make sure that you get a good understanding about it. What are the key factors? The key factors is this idea of moral strain, that it's difficult for us to always obey. And when we face those difficulties um, and we do obey, it's called destructive obedience because it's kind of doing something kind of we don't want to do. But it's because we have made the shift from being autonomous and thinking for ourselves to being agents of the authority figure. So we're no longer doing it because we want to do it. We're doing it because we feel we have to do it because that's the right thing to do. I don't think it's meant to be overly complex, but certainly it's important for you to kind of have a look and make a good understanding of what the agentic state or agentic shift explanation is all about. The second explanation I certainly think is so much easier. <clears throat> it says that the reason we would obey is because we recognize that there's somebody in a position of social control. And that person is somebody that, as Milgram says here, we have the shared expectation that they are a controlling figure. <clears throat> Within a school context, perhaps a teacher, um, head teacher, people like that are seen as controlling figures. We have a shared expectation, therefore, that that person has authority over us. So just to kind of add detail to as to why we obey. So we obey because they have that position of social control. But <clears throat> it says that this legitimate authority comes from the position in, in society and not from their characteristics. And we'll see later that maybe a charismatic person may actually have more legitimate authority or perceived authority. But of course, <clears throat> you don't have to like the teacher, you just have to listen to the teacher. So therefore the legitimate authority explanation is about how we recognize the social position and therefore we obey because we have to. In the Milgram experiment, we can see quite clearly that the experimenter plays this particular role. He's wearing all the symbols of legitimate authority in the science experiment. 
he's wearing the lab coat, which is an outward sign of authority. And you see this going to link to the next topic where we look at variables, where potentially if we kind of look the part in terms of having the outward signs of authority, we therefore have more authority. So therefore having these outward signs puts him in charge and therefore people obey him. <clears throat> this is a furthermore point because previously I said your char the characteristic of the person doesn't explain their legitimacy. But of course it does say that if you are charismatic, that you may actually be able to have a lot more power. And actually examples like Hitler and Stalin are, are good examples because they went on to have a fairly strong destructive obedience. But we can look at more modern context in terms of charismatic people. We could argue that when uh, Winston Churchill kind of stood up and kind of three speeches, he got people to obey. We could perhaps look at how <clears throat> somebody um, like Obama has a lot more kind of perceived kind of presence and power within a presidency. And certainly we would hope that um, even though we may not support kind of Trump, that he was able to charm certain people and therefore they believed he had the power or the legitimate authority. So there's lots of examples there. We also know that institutions, so universities, prisons, military, any place where there's kind of a kind of set organizational hierarchy, um, you can actually have uh, people who are in legitimate authority. As I said previously, somebody's in charge of me or somebody in charge of you, we would expect that they are able to tell us what to do and therefore we are obedient to them because they are in charge. Now, please, as I said, with the agentic state explanation, go back to your textbook, kind of read it through, kind of be able to summarize it into those main points. And the reason we are obedient here is because of the social role, which says that the person has legitimate authority over us and therefore obedient to that role and not obedient to the person. Now, there's going to be evaluation, obviously, for this topic because this is part of the explanation that they gave us for um, this specification that we need to look at explanations of obedience and therefore there could be an essay associated with this. What we do find is that we can quite easily find research support for legitimate authority. So research support, this is kind of um, an evaluation point because it's saying it's good that other people kind of would agree with this. So this time the research comes from Blash and Smith and they did quite an interesting study where they simply showed or watched, um, showed the film that I showed you, the Black and White film, to students and then asked the participants kind of questions and the, the participants quite clearly said that the experimenter was the person who was responsible um, in the film and that, that that was because he was seen as legitimate, okay? And he also said that by kind of wearing his kind of scientific kind of outfit and kind of talking about science, you also have, or seen as an expert authority on that. And so therefore, that's quite compelling kind of evidence that people perceive that particular um, film to kind of show that the experimenter had legitimate authority. We also find that this legitimacy may well also be shown in one of Milgram's replications. And in this replication, what happened was the experimenter was asked to leave the room and they suddenly need to replace him. So they replace him with a civilian. And most importantly, the civilian doesn't wear the lab coat. And once again, we find that this influences the outcome of obedience and it drops dramatically down to 20% from 65%. So therefore, when we see the person with a clear symbol or sign of obedience, then we know that people are likely to obey. So we say that the presence of a legitimate authority can increase obedience. Next on, we have a question about agentic state. We say it's limited. And of course, there's several things that we can say about agentic state in terms of its limitations. We know that one of the things we can say is about a third of the participants didn't obey. So therefore, 
how can we use agentic state to kind of explain kind of what's going on with them? And what we know is, is that they had the same social hierarchies. In other words, they had the same situation as everyone else. And therefore, they should have obeyed according to agentic state. The moral strain should have pushed them into a position where they ultimately acted as agents of authority. So we could then argue that there are other reasons why they haven't obeyed. And one of those reasons could be individual differences. Now, this is kind of a generic term within psychology to say, well, it's, it's who you are as a person. So their individual differences as people may be the reason for this. We also know <clears throat> that when I was evaluating the Milgram experiment, we kind of said that that type of obedience is found in in the real world, in the Huffling study. But we can now begin to be critical and look at the agentic state and say, well, it can't really be explained. You can't explain the outcome of the Huffling experiment using the agentic state because what is important is that they never showed a level of moral strain. So therefore, there must be something else that explains their obedience. It could well be legitimate authority, but certainly for now, we have this question over agentic theory saying it's limited because it cannot explain obedience in all situations. If it was a suitable explanation and in some ways legitimate authority becomes a, a more suitable explanation, um, it would explain all situations, including real world situations. Then we have a type of evaluation point that talks about alternative explanations. In other words, saying, OK, so I was I gave you two explanations, but is there pot potentially other explanations to explain real life events? Because Milgram's experiment did take place in a lab. But if you take perhaps real life events, perhaps extreme real life events like genocide, can we use the agentic state to explain that? And the question is really no. And we have to turn to another explanation. So if I want to explain genocide, I can explain it using something called dehumanization. Now, of course, in the class, I made a big deal of dehumanization. But it is simple as this. For example, if you eat meat, you are dehumanizing animals. Now, that's quite easy because you might see them as being animals. And therefore, we, you know, we can eat an animal because it's not human. And therefore, we don't have any moral strain because an animal is seen as lesser. So what I'm going to say here is destructive obedience may happen because the person actually views it as being uh, views them as being lesser. Now, I've got a couple of examples that I'm going to use using genocide, and then I'm going to bring it back on Milgram. So if somebody is perceived as being lesser, then they could be deserving of the treatment. For example, a pig that's bred to be made into bacon is deserving of that particular situation in life, and therefore I can eat the bacon sandwich as I please. So does this happen in real world situations? Because that was what my point was all about. My point was about these alternative explanations to explain destructive obedience. So here's the first example. So the Nazis called the Jews subhuman and inferior, and therefore killing them was not about making the shift from being in, in the autonomous state to being an agent of authority, but killing them because actually they felt that that was right. Second of all, in Rwanda, there was a genocide where 800,000 Tutsis were killed by the Hutus. And now there's a lot of colonial issues relating to this particular genocide, but we also know that the, there's a radio station that was broadcasting on a daily basis and calling the Tutsis cockroaches in that, and that, and in that particular culture could be demonizing the Tutsis. And that genocide resulted in 800,000 people dying in just over 40 days. So this seems to be a more likely explanation for destructive obedience, that people are being dehumanized. But 
that seems fine for Rwanda and for the Holocaust. But is this true of Milgram? Could we take an alternate explanation like dehumanization and explain why 65% of the people went to 450 votes? Well, Milgram collected some other data as well. And he said, if I have found somebody who said, that guy in there was so stupid, he deserved to be shocked. In other words, there's a clear sign of superiority that they felt that the person was inferior and therefore deserved to be shocked. Now, this is a crucial part of the course that we need to be able to explain obedience. We need to be able to be critical of it. And I would encourage you to read around this. There's also the Beyond the Shock Machine book by Gina Perry that we have in the office that you're welcome to borrow and definitely worth having a look at. Now to end this video, I just want to have a look at the question which I showed you in class. It's a question that came from a sample exam paper. You can find this on the AQA website. And I asked two questions. Outline two explanations for obedience and briefly evaluate one of the explanations. So therefore, I just want to run through a couple of things with you. It says outline, and it's also referring to two. So as an examiner, I'm looking at the specification and quite clearly looking for two explanations. I'm not looking for gradual commitment. I'm not looking for any of these other ones. I'm looking for the two that are named in the specification. And therefore, let's look at a student response. So we see here in the student response that they do list legitimate authority and agentic state. Now, of course, the question says outline two explanations, not list or name those two explanations. So please don't be tempted to think that that gets you any credit. It just helps me with ticking the box that says they have actually got the two explanations. And so you only really get credit when you when you, when you say something. So when we read this, is that there's someone, um, this is where somebody is obedient because it is thought that he or she has the right to give the order. The person has power to administer sanctions. We're brought up to socialize, to follow orders. So therefore, those are where the two marks come for legitimate authority. Now, that's not the three marks that I was hoping for. It's only two. So then we move on to the next one. Another is where we find ourselves in the agentic state. We see ourselves as agents of the person given order. Now, this is really difficult because it's not even, it's about a half a mark. But of course, we don't give half marks, so you might it might well be dependent on who marks your particular paper. We're certainly looking at two marks and maximum three, if if at all. We then go into the second part of the question, where they try to evaluate. And what we see here is that they make reference to something like uniform, but they don't really evaluate the correct part of the course. They haven't evaluated agentic state or legitimate authority. Um, even though they've referred to legitimate authority, they don't really answer the question and therefore they wouldn't get any marks for this. Now, obviously, when I do go through these exam questions in class, please do listen to them. Try and apply what you've learned from that question into others. I hope that you have enjoyed this video and I trust that um, these videos have been helpful to you. Okay, that's all for now.